Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Abigail. Those were kind words, and I really appreciate And, oh, my God, could you believe that song that LaVon just sang? I'm thinking of having her come back up again, sing it one more time, and we'll just call this service done. She, that... First, as Abigail said, I, I teach a monthly um, class on mysticism. Well, this year it's mysticism. And one of the things I've invited students to do is try creating some poetry. Let spirit move through you, call it fr forth from within you, and just let the words come out on paper. Let your poetry, let your story come out on paper. Or a song. Or a piece of art. Or if for this month here at Center for Spiritual Living, maybe it's a plant. But let something creative come out of you. That's one way in which you know that the Spirit of God is moving through you. You know you are one with it. Could you not see that in LaVon's song? Oh, my gosh. That just gave me goosebumps. So, thank you. Um, oh, glasses. Glasses, mic. I have everything. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you all for being here. I've seen so many great friends and people from my class. And it's just delightful to actually see you in person, so I appreciate it. And as you've probably known if you've been here for the past couple of weeks, Kathy Ann has been talking about um, about seeding the future, like, like, like what do you want for your personal future, for the future of this nation, for the future of the world? What would you like to see? And then how do we plant the thoughts that seed that future? How do we do what's ours to do to nurture that growing? Which reminds me, so we're talking about gardening and flowers and all that. I picked this dress out special so I'd look like a flower. Did I achieve it? <laughs> Come on, just like a flower. So, um, so anyway, um, gardening, though, I mean, isn't that a wonderful metaphor, like for, you know, planting, planting thoughts and seeing what grows up? And today we're having a plant sale. Did y'all notice? So that you can all take home a plant and see the glory of God just happening. Well, gardening is a great metaphor. Um, I live in an area where... I have wonderful neighbors. That's one thing I'll have to say about Texas is I've just met some really, really wonderful people. And all my neighbors are into gardening. I mean, if you go to one neighbor's house, it's like walking through the secret garden. She's got plants growing up that would, you know, just loaded with flowers, and it's absolutely beautiful. Another neighbor has at least 200 orchids in her house. She grows them, and she'll take my dead orchids, and she'll blow on them and talk to them and give them whatever magic she's got, and they come back to life. And she, seriously, this lady... Kathy, if you're listening, you're crazy. But she, during during the really cold, I mean, during the really warm times, she'll take these 200 plants and put them outside so they can get some nice natural sun. And then, when it gets cold, she takes them all back inside. No kidding! She does this. She takes them all back inside, and she cares for them. Can you guys feel the level of love that she has for them? 200 orchids, she knows every one of their names. Like, like I know Karen and Abigail. Oh no, she has a long, um, Latin name for each one, and she calls them by that and loves on them. Anyway, 
not me. Another, another neighbor, um, has got this a very intricate outdoor vegetable garden. And you know what? Stuff comes up for her. She loves her garden so much. Stuff comes up for her in, um, seasons that it's not supposed to come up. Like she'll just come over and say, Oh, look, it's really unusual that this could be harvested at this time, but here you go. It's like, okay, and nobody else could grow it except you, Mary Ellen. So, um, yeah, my neighbors are all into gardening. And it is the, it is the community joke that they will bring me over one of those little tiny plants, you know, that has got potential. And they'll bring it over to me when we have a dinner or something and give it to me. And I look at it like, what am I supposed to do with this? Right. And so one will say, don't worry, Sharon, we'll go ahead. I'll go ahead and plant it for you. Let me find just the perfect space. And the other one will say, and you know what? If you just give me coffee in the morning, I'll come over and water your plants. And this, so between all my neighbors, they divide up the duties. One brings, <laughs> one brings some fertilizer. She, she raises chicken. She brings over chicken poop. And you know, I, they, they all divide it up because they know. I won't do it because I just like get lost and I want to do something else. You know, I want to read spiritual books or go for a walk or something, but I don't want to tend plants. So thank you, all of you. If you're watching, thank you for doing that for me because otherwise I wouldn't have those lovely plants. However, let me tell you an amazing thing. Anybody that, has anybody here ever lived in Texas? Okay, then do you know about Texas wildflower season? Beautiful, right? I mean, you've got blue bonnets coming up and you've got Indian paintbrush coming up and you've got the little yellow flowers and you've got the little blue flowers and you've got the, the white flowers that come out when it rains. Um, and, but you, it's a, a profusion of beautiful wildflowers all over the sides of the freeways. It's just gorgeous. Well, I can't even grow wildflowers or thought I couldn't. I tried one little potted plant of a, a potted plant of a wildflower. Give me a break. And I couldn't get that to grow. But the second year I was in Texas, there started to be a bunch of wildflowers growing along my fence. Now, God knows I love flowers. The fact that I can't take care of them does not mean I don't love them and appreciate them. But they started to grow these just a few wildflowers along my fence. I got so excited. You know why I got excited? Flowers were happening and I didn't have to do anything. It was like, God, when people ask me, what's your idea of grace? That's grace. Like I didn't have to do anything. I just love flowers so much that, that they descended upon me. So I made my, the guy who takes care of my yard, who mows, mows the yard, you have to mow around them. Do not mow down a single one. So the poor guy is looking at me and mowing around these little island, islands of flowers. The second year, there were more. The third year, even more. To the point where half my whole front yard is covered in the beautiful wildflowers. All different colors. They're beautiful. I never did anything for them. They grow. I don't even have to water them. Even my neighbors, my horticulture neighbors, come over and marvel at them. So, but what did I do? Well, I didn't do anything. No, I noticed them. I noticed them. I gloried in them. I gave thanks for them. I often go out, go out in the morning just to check if they're still there. I love them. I love them. So that's what I did. I noticed and I appreciated and I enjoyed them. 
So what does that have to do with today's talk? Today's talk, if you read the little blurb that I wrote up, is called, What Am I Missing? It was supposed to be about um, if you're praying for something and you feel like your, it's, your prayers aren't being answered. Anybody ever experienced that besides me? Yeah, yeah. It's like some, sometimes it just happens, like the wildflowers. Sometimes stuff just emerges when you say, this is what I, this is what I want. And other times, well, I have to tell you a little story. There's a, there's a minister in, in Texas. Um, it, it, do, does anybody here get the Science of My magazine? If you do, then you're familiar with Jesse Jennings. He writes every month in the, in the um, Science of My magazine. Guy's brilliant. Well, I was listening to one of his talks on Sunday, and he said, he was so cute. He goes, we came from the mystery. And everybody's like, yeah, we did. And he goes, and when we die, we go back to the mystery. Everybody's like, yeah, yeah, that's right, right. And he goes, but you know, while we're in the middle, why do we all want certainty? We have to have certainty. We have to know why everything happens. We have to know why our prayers weren't answered. And why your prayers aren't answered? I don't know. I'll give you a couple of clues, but I don't know. That's for you and the God within you to figure out. And it's a glorious journey to figure it out. So I'll give you some ideas. Um, one is, you know how they say that if you pray believing, hi, Peter. If you pray believing, then um, then you will receive. Anybody heard that? Isn't it a great promise? It's like, yeah, okay, all I have to do is believe and it'll happen. <laughs> but but um, sometimes we have competing beliefs. What? Yeah, really. Sometimes we have competing beliefs. Like one of us. Uh, may decide that we want to have great health. Whatever it is we're suffering from, we want that gone. Anybody been there besides me? We want it gone. We want to feel energetic and spot on. And, um, and nothing's happening. Well, sometimes maybe tucked way inside our subconsciousness is this idea, if I felt completely well, I might have to do something with my life. I might have to follow that call. If any, anybody here, uh, read, read author called Tosha Silver. She's incredible. And so those of you who've read her know she spent years in bed, just years, like really, really sick in bed. And I, I think it was the only thing that really moved her out to get healed was she finally said yes to divine order, divine order that called her to be basically a, a mystic. She's, she's, yeah. So she writes and she speaks and she helps people out. But that was, it was kind of that, yes, I will, I will say yes to that. And then she got well. She found the right people to help her. So sometimes we say we want health, but is there something underneath? Just ask yourself that. Just ask yourself. Sometimes we say we want to be abundant. Yeah, use the R word. We want to be rich. We want money to fall like waterfall from the sky. At least that's been my prayer in the past. <laughs> Just waterfall from the sky. I'm ready for it, baby. And, um, but then sometimes if we look a little deeper, the competing belief might be that, you know, I don't really trust rich people. I mean, really wealthy people, they might not have gotten their wealth in a nice way. And what are they doing with all that wealth anyway? They should be sharing it with all of us, right? So sometimes we think, I want wealth, but I don't want it. Right? So just look. Just look inside. Ask. Um, what about relationships? 
Anybody ever want the perfect, perfect partner? That person will, will complete you and, and, uh, and you, you'll be, um, you'll be in relationship for the rest of your life and honored and respected. And then discovered that maybe the little competing belief is that in all the relationships you've had before, you haven't been able to trust them or you've gotten hurt by that person or, or something's happened where you're not really sure you do want to be in relationship again. So, God, this is what I want. Oh, God, this is what I don't want. God, this is what I want. Oh, God, this is what... Do you see how the beliefs can... So, um, another thing is, this is one thing that Reverend Don talks about a lot, that we make covenants with the Spirit. We make covenants about, okay, I really want... Um, I really want... Let's take health, for example. And... I covenant with God that I will accept health and I will do nothing to make that happen. How many of you have ever tried to make health happen? And was it successful? Not very. You know, be, being able to covenant and go in partnership with the spirit where you say, I want to experience health and, and, I will do my part and leave the rest up to spirit. Okay? So, number one, are you doing your part? When you pray for something, are you doing your part? Uh, let me give you an example. I have a sister, an older sister. And when my delightful husband and I, Paul, Paul, Paul I couldn't, I couldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for Paul. He has been my biggest cheerleader. He has totally been the face of God lifting me up so many times in our, in our almost 50 years together. So thank you, Paul. Anyway, um, anyway, Paul and I finished a remodel on our house and I was telling my older sister about it and she said, oh, I want to do a remodel too. I said, yes, go for it. And she said, oh, I can't afford it. Well, how much would it cost? I don't know. Well, 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 why don't you go and talk to somebody? She belongs to a very, very close-knit church. And I said, well, I, I'm sure that you've got contractors in the church that you could ask somebody. And um, so I didn't hear from her about that thing for nine months. And then she called me at the end of nine months and said, well, the remodel's done. You should come out and see it. What? <laughs> I said, how did that? And she said, well, I took your advice. She said, I went to one of the contractors in the church, and he said, well, Sheila, you got to tell me what you want. <laughs> How many times have we heard that? you got to tell me what you want. So she had to get clear about what she wanted, and then he could give her a price. And she said, and it was still too much for me. But there was something that enabled her, now that she started doing her part, there was something that enabled her to pray from a place that she did believe it could happen. She now knew what she wanted. She could break it up into little parts. She got the remodel done, and it was like the blue bonnets. It happened. People sprang up over here and said, well, you know, I could do your tile work for you. you. You sang at my daughter's wedding. I'd love to do that for you. Somebody else sprang up like a wildflower over here and said, you know what, Sheil? Um, I, my, my, I can do the framing for you. In fact, if you give me your son, doesn't it sound like give me your firstborn son? Yeah. No, if you give me your son, she had seven kids. She could spare one. If you give me your son... <laughs> If you give me your son and he comes to inter intern for me, he can help me with the building of it, right? And um, so all sorts of things, like the blue bonnets, all sorts of things started to happen and her remodel was done. Is it still too much for her when she looks back? She goes, I don't know how that ever happened. I don't know how the blue bonnets sprang up. So... Um, check to see if you have competing beliefs. Check to see if you're doing what's yours to do. Do you know how scary it was for my older sister to go and get a quote? 
I felt like that before. I might look foolish if I don't have the money up front and I go and ask for a quote. That would be stupid. So something in you will give you the courage to do what's yours to do. If you're really asking for something in prayer, there's something for you to do. And one other way, one other reason in my life that things, that prayers haven't been answered is because there's, maybe there's something better. Anybody ever discovered that? Something better on the, on the horizon. Um, Paul and I decided that we wanted to buy a house. We made our list. Every th single thing that we want, to the, even to the point of we want to, it to rise in, and, I mean the sun to rise in the east and that's our view in the morning. No, does that sound like I had an option of the sun rising in the east? No, <laughs> we wanted, we want, we wanted our house to face the rising sun. Better said, right? Yeah, so. You're really getting demanding, Sharon. So, so anyway, so anyway, we found a house that, uh, that was just beautiful. Actually, I fell in love with the 10 foot sculpture in front of the house that went along with the sale, maybe more than I love the house. But I really wanted it, I wanted it, I wanted it. And we made an offer on it. We didn't get it. In fact, it got sold to somebody else. And oh my God, the wailing that happened. <laughs> Not Paul. Paul was very cool and calm. He, he was like, Sharon, it's going to be okay. There, there's something else. But no, nobody else has this 10 foot sculpture. Anyway, the, within two months, we found another house that hit 105% of what we said we wanted. The previous house, except for the sculpture, which I didn't know I wanted, but except for the sculpture, hit maybe 50%. God knows. And when I say God knows what you want or God, God's will, it sounds like it's something out there that's tapping you. It's not. It's something within here that is moving out. That within here is also connected to the in, to the in here of Karen. It's also connected to the in here of Abigail and everybody else. That's how Paul was able to know with complete certainty. Within him, he knew there was a better place out there. He didn't know exactly the address yet, but he knew it. Make sense? So you got all of these reasons why prayer might not be answered. And so go within. Ask the question. Go within. And if you're still not getting any answers, sometimes it helps to have a midwife for those answers. And that midwife can look like one of our beloved practitioners. Everybody here that's a practitioner, will you stand up? Look, look around the room, look around the room when you feel stuck and it's like, I can't hear the voice of God within me. Contact one of these people. They know how to, they, they know you as the face of God. They know that you are filled with the power, the intelligence, the love of God. And they can be such an open vessel that you will discover what is standing in your way. So thank you all. Thank you all for your commitment to seeing the world in, in the way that God sees the world. Um, so, back to the wildflowers. What's yours to do? Maybe what's yours to do today, just because it's a gardening metaphor and I dress like a flower and we're, and we're, and, and we're talking about wildflowers and stuff, maybe what's yours to do is to just notice. Just kick back into the relaxation of, I don't have to do a lot. I don't, I have to do what's mine to do and, and God will inform me when I need to go get a quote from the contractor. But other than that, I need to open my eyes and behold the glory that is coming up all around.
Even when my sister was getting the contractor, do you realize the glory of God that was happening when all these people said, well, hell, I can help. Then no, they didn't say hell. They go to church. Um, heck, Sheila, I can, I can help you with, help you with that. Or, um, yeah, let's do this. And, you know, or you, ways in which the glory of God was showing up as everybody else. Maybe what we're being called to do is to just notice when the good is showing up. Notice the good, the beauty around us. Notice when, when, um, when good happens. But why, why would we do that? So what? Guess what? It, those of you who have gone to Beyond Limits or uh, Reverend Karen's class, know that that um, one of the things that happens is that what we notice ma- multiplies. If we start noticing good, like the wildflowers, we will start noticing other good. If we start noticing people showing up to help us with a project, more people will show up. It's the way of the universe. In the Bible, so I'm going to ask you, okay, Karen? So, are you ready? Okay, so in the Bible, in the feeding of the 5,000, they, um, uh, they talk about, you know, how Jesus took, they have 5,000 hungry people. I mean, 5,000 hungry people, they could turn on you, right? So, they have 5,000 hungry people. And he had... Two loaves and five fish or some combination of that, right? And so what does Jesus do? Oh, Lord, I give you that. Or Father, I give thanks. I give thanks. Make this all work, please, today. And, <laughs> and, and he tells his apostles, go ahead and pass it out. The apostles do. What happened at the end, Karen? <laughs> there are 12 baskets left over. Yes! <laughs> now! Don't you think the Bible authors could have stopped at, and everyone was fed? End of story. No. Somebody thought to notice, to notice the abundance. Somebody thought to notice and tell about the profusion of good. They didn't all just get fed. There were 12 baskets left over. That is the way God works through us. God does not work through lack or limitation. God works through abundance. And there's lots left over for everyone. So from that place, that's why I say notice the good. This Bible author noticed the good and decided to tell the rest of us about it. So why don't we do this? I think we just get trained by society from the time that we grow up. We're taught to look out, be on your guard, look out for those things that are dangerous, like, like the outdoors, right, LaVon? (laughs) Be, Be on guard, right? So what are we constantly looking for? Things that might hurt us, things that might threaten us. So what do we get more of? So we'll see. We will see what we go in search of. So I'm, I'm uh, convinced that we have what Emma Curtis Hopkins calls when people, you know, when you're ta- told to name your good, we have this conviction, very human conviction of absence that it's not there and it's not going to be there for us. Like my sister, I don't have the money for that. A conviction of absence. Well, um, how about you said you wanted a partner? Yeah, but I'm not likely to get one. A a conviction of absence. That, and we don't want to pray from that. Emma is constantly telling us pray from the conviction of presence. The conviction that the remodel is already here and I'm going to do my part and God's going to do his part and something miraculous and good is going to happen. And let me stay on the lookout. Let me stay on the lookout for what today's good is. 
Conviction of presence. Try it. Try it. Keep a prayer journal and every day look back on yesterday's prayers and say, is there any little growth? Is there any little manifestation? Is there a little wildflower in there? Something that I can praise and enjoy. So make the visibility present. Make the visibility welcome. Welcome. Come, come right in. I have a big yard. There's lots of place for those wildflowers to expand. Come right in. I will love you. So how do we do it? Go in search of God. Go in search of good. It is a wonderful journey just to tiptoe like Levon did, going into, <laughs> going into the outdoors, going into the outdoors. And there were things that shocked her and things that, that, um, uh, were new to her. And yet when she came face to face with that whole life and death thing happening, couldn't you guys feel Feel what was going on in her? Thank you so much for sharing that. So um, go in search of God. Go in search of good. Go in search of miracles. They're happening all around you, all right now. <sighs> One of the miracles that I've noticed lately is since I've been teaching the mysticism class, I've gotten a greater sense of peace. I've noticed that my go-to when stuff happens is I get angry because I want to be right. I get anxious because I'm looking out for things happening. I get irritated. All of that is not non-peace. And I've been reading a book by Gary Hawkins called Power Versus Force that many of you I, I can tell by the underlines that I've read it at least four times. And <laughs> as my friend Yvonne says, you know, thank God for getting older. We never need to buy new books. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but what I noticed is that I'm willing to be in that place of peace. And one of the things Gary Hawkins says is that if you get in the place of peace, now think about the Dalai Lama. Any of you who've been in, the, in his presence when, when he's speaking, which I've had one opportunity to do that, the whole room becomes at peace. And that's one of the things that Hawkins says in his book is that you can affect the world, that you being at peace can affect the world. So never Never, never think that things are hopeless or that you are helpless. Just take a deep breath and instead of being angry at what's going on on the TV, take a deep breath and say, I choose peace here and walk out of the room. Try it, try it. It is a magical thing. I, I cannot even begin to, to describe it. So in summary, make place for the wildflowers. Make them welcome. Make them welcome by always looking for them. Make, make the demonstrations in your life, your answered prayers, welcome by always looking for it. Is it there? Is it there? Enjoy the good that's happening right in front of you that you, you didn't even plan. You didn't, you didn't, that wasn't even a prayer. And yet there it is. There it is. So um, that's my summary um, to invite you to have the con conviction that good is happening. Look for it, see it, and become that contagion to the world. So are you going to do it? Okay. So, so, so Jake says, see, Jake, right before, right before the first service, did this song, uh, that I remember when I grew up in Hawaii and I used to dance it all the time. It's called Pearly Shells. Oh, somebody, somebody told me that it also is a CNH sugar song, but I know. I never heard it. So, but what, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have a mic, but what I'm gonna do is just tell you the words. It's pearly shells from the ocean, shining in the sun, covering the shore. When I see you, 
When I notice you, I can't tell you how many times I've walked along the beach. Oh, my life is so horrible. And there's all these pearly shells that will remind you of the love in your life. So, so. Love you, love you.